Are you praying about something? Well, Charles Spurgeon reminds us of the importance of perseverance in our prayers. He said, prayer pulls the rope below and the great bells ring above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly. Others give but an occasional pluck of the rope. But he who wins with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. I love Spurgeon. Welcome to Through the Bible. It's a great day to be studying God's Word, isn't it? And we'll be exploring what Jesus said about how to communicate best with the Father in a familiar passage in Luke 18. Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us today that prayer is an attitude of life. It agonizes with God, it doesn't let self get in the way, and it doesn't get discouraged. Dr. McGee asks, have you prayed about the situation in the world? And have you prayed for the President of the United States? Why don't you add those things to your persistent prayer list, regardless of how you voted? We'll begin today with a parable from Jesus telling us what to do when we don't quickly get an answer to our prayers. But before we get to Luke 18, I got a letter that I want to share with you from a missionary. Here it is. A year ago, I left the United States to teach primary school on a Christian hospital compound in Bangladesh. Before leaving, my mentor challenged me to find a systematic way to keep myself in the Word of God on a daily basis. As a child, I heard Dr. McGee's voice coming from the radio in my parents' room early in the morning, so before leaving last September, I downloaded several books of the Bible onto my MP3 player. As the year has gone by, God has been faithful to meet my needs, and He has provided daily spiritual growth through your broadcasts. Thank you for helping to take God's Word to the world, and also for equipping and encouraging others to do the same. Well, that's such a great letter. And how's God using our time in His Word to equip you? Well, we'd certainly love to hear your story. So why don't you write to Bible Bus at ttb.org or to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Let's pray for one another as we begin our journey today in Luke. Lord, thank you that you are faithful in using your word to bring us into fellowship with you. We ask that More would turn to you today, Lord. More would know the precious name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now as we come to the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we've come, by the way, to a very wonderful portion of the Word of God. And I want to say just this word about him personally at this time. And I hope you will not misunderstand me. I believe that he was God manifest in the flesh. But I also believe that he was not any less God because he was man. But on the other hand, I believe that he was not any more man because he was God. I think he was a perfect man, a real man. I think very frankly, had you been there in that day, you would have enjoyed his company. I think it would have been a real privilege to have been in his company and to have heard his laughter. I don't like pictures of him at all, but I never saw a picture of him laughing, and I think he laughed many times. We're coming to an incident that I'm confident that a great many smile when he talked to him about what he's going to talk to them in this particular section here. My, this is a very wonderful incident that he's going to give us here, and it's on prayer, by the way. And this is very important, but our Lord was so human. (laughs) You'd have loved him, to have known him. You would have been in his presence and just had the best time that you ever had. You know certain human beings down here. You love to be with them. You love their company. I know that there are several preachers. I love to be with them. They sharpen my wits and my mental powers, I get rather sleepy mentally unless I have somebody to sharpen me. And I love to be with these brethren, and they're wholesome men. They're men that you enjoy to be with. And one of them, my, when he's up preaching, he sounds so pompous and serious, but he's a real human being, and he tells some of the funniest jokes I've ever listened to. Our Lord was good at that. Will you follow me now in chapter 18? He spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now he's given the other side of prayer. Before he said, 
that you don't have to storm the gates of heaven and knock the door down to get God to hear you. But he also saying here, don't be discouraged in your prayer life and just keep plugging at it. I think that we just need to keep praying. I want God to intervene. My, how wonderful it is to have him intervene. Now, listen to him, because this is a good one. Saying there was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. Typical politician, you see. We've got a lot of them just like this today. And we've got a lot of judges like this. They feared not God, neither regarded man. Everybody, I think, smiled because in that day, I think they knew who the judge was. And in our day, I have a notion you know who the judge is also. Well, let's read on. That was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. This poor widow, you know, she came, brought a case to this judge. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by continual coming she weary me. And avenge him means give her justice. Make sure she's given justice in the courts. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And now he draws from that this lesson. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Won't he protect his own which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find the faith on the earth. Now, I want to go back and look at this parable because this parable is a great one. It's a wonderful one. And I hope you won't mind if I paraphrase just a little here because I think we need to do that. You remember last time he'd been talking about the days of Noah and the days of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we live in a day when there's turmoil and trouble and crisis and criticism, doubt and disaster. There has been Vietnam. There has been the marches and the protests and the college campuses and the slums and the streets. And there's only two alternatives for you today, friends. Either you're going to faint or you're going to pray. And someone gave this little graffiti. If your knees knock together, kneel on them. That was in a churchyard in London during the Blitz. Now, prayer is an attitude of the life. It's the very essence of the life. And it's more than just uttering words. It's more than that. It is to long for the ultimate, to strive for the far-off goal, to long for the will of God. It's not just a Sunday morning to toss it off lightly, thy will be done. Do you really want the will of God? Now, this parable reveals persistence is rewarded. And what he's giving here is a parable by contrast. Now, God is no unjust judge, but the parable's about an unjust judge. He's a typical politician, and this poor widow, she came to him, and she said, I'm having trouble. I can't get justice in the lower courts, and I've appealed to you, and I wonder if you wouldn't help me. And he sort of looked up her record, and frankly, she didn't carry any weight in her community. She didn't count for any votes, you see. She couldn't get him any votes when he ran for office. He could pass her by. There are a lot of politicians like that. In fact, I don't know about you, but I'm very weary of these men that at the time that they're running for office, and some of them seem to be running for office quite a bit of the time, they're always talking about the public, and they're talking about you and me, the common man, and how they long to help us, and how they long to do something for us. And all that I've done is I've just kept been voting for men that would keep raising my taxes. They're not helping me any. They just raise more taxes to build more schools, to burn them down. I'm tired of that. I don't know about you, but they're always talking about that. They've got my interest at heart. I found out they're after my vote. And then when they get in office, they forget all about me. I couldn't even get in through the fifth secretary in order to see them. And that was this poor widow's situation. She didn't carry very much weight, and she couldn't get in there to see the 
judge, but she decided she's going to see him. And he didn't do anything, and so she comes into the office one day and says the secretary wants to see the judge. And believe me, the secretary said, you can't see him. He hasn't come in yet. And then she sits in the outer office, and the secretary said, well, it may be several hours. She said, I don't care, I'll wait. She sits out there, and two hours go by, and finally the door opens, and here comes the judge, and he walks in. And she makes a beeline for him and begins to talk, and he just keeps walking. And he says, see my secretary, and opens the door to his inner office and goes in. And so the secretary said, you just well leave. He's busy. He won't be able to see you. She said, I'll wait. So she waited. The secretary smiled because the judge wasn't going to be able to see her that day at all. He was busy. And so the woman just sat there, and the secretary thought, well, She'll leave when she gets hungry. And so finally the judge called in and says, is that woman still out there? And said, yes, she's still there. Oh, he says, then she'll leave when she gets hungry. The secretary went back, and in another couple hours she called. She says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Said she brought her lunch, and she's sitting out here munching it. The judge says, oh, my, and I have a luncheon engagement. He said, I got to get out of here some way. So it goes down a fire escape. Well, you know, he does that for several days, and finally it, it gets around that the judge is going down the fire escape, and that doesn't look good for a judge to go down the fire escape to go to lunch. And they think maybe he may be up to something. Finally, he says, well, I just have to see that widow. He's not interested in her, but just because she kept on. Now, the whole thought is this. God's not an unjust judge. You don't have to just knock the door down. Really, you don't, but don't faint. Just persist in prayer. That's what he's saying. And it's not the length of your prayer. Paul uses a very wonderful expression, and I'd like to pass it on to you because we need this kind of help today. And this is something that all of you can do to help us and help yourself for that matter. It's over in Romans, the 15th chapter, verse 30. Listen to Paul. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Now, that's what he asked them to pray for. But he says that ye strive together. And you know what that word strive really means? Well, it's the word that we get our word agonize from, and that's exactly what it is. You see, to agonize in prayer, that doesn't mean the length of your prayer. It's the depth of your prayer. It's not the words, but the feeling that's back of it. My, this is the way that Moses prayed. It's the way Paul prayed. And it's the way we should pray today. That widow sure was persistent, wasn't she? And God's no unjust judge. And you can afford to just keep going to him in prayer. And if you really mean business, you're going to move the arm of God one way or another. And he may make it clear to you that he's not going to do the thing exactly as you want it done. But he's going to hear and answer your prayer. And that's the reason I think we ought to just lay hold of God in a very definite way today about these things that concern us, that we feel deeply. And as you look about you today, friend, don't be discouraged. Don't faint. Please don't faint. Pray. That's what we're to do in days like this. Have you prayed about the situation today? Have you prayed really for the President of the United States? Doesn't make any difference who he is. Pray for him because he's making a lot of decisions that affect us today and have to do with the climate in this country and abroad. Now he gave another parable here. It's a parable about a Pharisee and a publican. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And you'll never get anywhere praying like that, by the way. And a great many people pray down, you know, to other folk. They go to the Lord, they say, Oh, brother so-and-so, he's in a bad way. He's departed from the Lord. Bring him back and bring this dear woman back and bring that. What about you? Pray for yourself, friends. We need to pray for ourselves lest we be tempted. Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one, the spirit of meekness, lest what? Same thing happen to you. So we need to pray for ourselves too. 
Now here is the parable, and I think he drew it from real life, and I do not know who the publican is, but I think I know who the Pharisee is. We're going to come to him in the 19th chapter, and that's Zacchaeus. I think he was the publican that's here. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And I love the way the Lord Jesus said that, and I think everybody smiled. He prayed with himself. He didn't go into the, the temple to pray to God for anybody. He went into the temple to pat himself on the back and tell himself what a smart fellow he was. And if I may revert back to the nursery rhyme, he reached in his thumb and he pulled out a plum and he said, what a smart boy am I. That's the Pharisee. Now notice, listen to him. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Believe me, in my book, he's a bigger sinner than all this crowd that he listed here. And he's worse sinner than the publican. That's what our Lord is saying. And notice what he did. He's a religious phony, by the way. And he went through religious exercises. He says, I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Oh, is he a nice boy. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that poor publican stood away off. And actually, he didn't say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, when that man was a publican, he couldn't go to the mercy seat in the temple. That was denied him. He had no part there. He was shut out from it. And what he's saying to God is, oh, God, make a mercy seat for me, a poor publican, to go to. And we're going to find out the Lord did just that thing, and he told a publican about it, and it'll be Zacchaeus. And I'll go in more in detail when we get over to the 19th chapter, and we're going to be there, by the way, next time. But here is the contrast between these two. And he asked the question, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. And I suppose the biggest stumbling block that all of us have is ourselves. I think the greatest hindrance today to being saved is self, because the man thinks he's good enough to be saved and he doesn't need to be saved. And the greatest hindrance today to Christian service is the reason God doesn't use a great many talented people today. To begin with, he never gave them a gift that they think they've got. They have arbitrarily attempted to use a gift. Now, I know a woman that wants to sing. She's determined to be a soloist. A young woman, she's taken music from about everybody. And I don't know much about music, but I know one thing, she can't sing. And yet she persists in it, and she feels like she's got a wonderful voice, and she doesn't have. And may I say that she could serve God some other capacity. I don't know what it would be, but she certainly could, because she is a Christian, I think God's given her a gift. But that gift just does not happen to be singing. You see, Lord, I'm a singer. Now, I want you to help me out. Or, Lord, I'm a preacher. I want you to help me out. Well, Lord, it's not that. Lord, I'm a sinner. Help me out. Show me what you want me to do. That's the important thing. That's the all-important thing. You see, self gets in the way here. Paul said that he saw within his flesh there was no good thing, and that what he wanted to do, he didn't do. Who got in the way? The devil? No, Paul got in the way. That old nature that we could label Saul, you see. What a marvelous thing that he does here. And then our wonderful Lord here... Oh, isn't he wonderful in this chapter? I think he had them all laughing. <laughs> they all were laughing. It's wonderful to be with him. And notice now, children love to be with him, and they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Even the disciples said, Oh, don't bring the little children to them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, Forbid them not far off such is the kingdom of God. That is a tremendous thing. 
that little one dies in infancy, you can be sure of one thing. Our Lord said that his, not his angel, his spirit is before my Father in heaven. He says here, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. You remember he'd already said something about offending these little ones. And he said it'd be better for you that a millstone is hung around your neck. You see, the little one will follow you. The little one actually thinks you're God. Do anything you want them to do. Has complete trust in you. God have mercy on you if you don't bring them the right way and bring them to God. He said, suffer the little one. Let them come to me. Don't try to keep them from coming to me. And they would normally come to him. Oh, you say, but you say they have a fallen nature. They sure do. But you see, that little one <laughs> hasn't reached the age of accountability. And the only decision it can make is the decision that's suggested to it. But that's the nature of the little child. And then the little one grows up and develops that little will of his own. Then that's when the trouble begins, is it not? Our Lord says, let them come to me. Now we have here the instance of this rich young ruler. And the Lord Jesus loved this man. May I say that it's another very wonderful story. And I'm just going to touch it for the simple reason. We've had it in Matthew and we had it again in Mark. And one thing that we'd like to say about this young man is that our Lord made inquiry about the young man's conduct. You know, the... Ten Commandments are divided in what's known as the pietus and the probitus. The pietus is a man's relationship to God. The probitus is a man's relationship to man. Well, the very interesting thing is, this is the life of this young man. And this life of this young man was a good life, by the way. He kept the part of the commandments that related him to man. And the very interesting thing is that this young man could pass on those first ones. But what about his relationship to God? That was his problem. He demanded that the young man put Jesus first. That's what he's saying. And he had riches, and he'd been putting those first. And he showed the young man the impossibility of man to save himself. You've got to give up everything and come follow me. And in spite of all of that, Jesus loved this young man in spite of the fact he would not follow him, and he'll love you. Well, who is that young man? I do not know who he is. It may be you today. I don't know. But he loves you. I do know that. And let me just read this. A certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and the mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. And I say to you, he's a remarkable young man. But down here in his relationship to God, that's exactly what he did not have. All right, we'll go by that then. And we find, again, the Lord Jesus is announcing his death to his disciples in verse 31. He announces that. And then the blind man is healed near Jericho. We've had that before in both Matthew and Mark. So next time, I take up the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Until next time, may God richly bless you. Well, that was a great chapter. There's so many things to take to heart, especially about prayer. And if you'd like to listen to this study again, we got a lot of different options for you. You can listen online for free anytime. You can stream it, download it, subscribe to it via podcast with Through the Bible's app on your phone. You can listen anytime. You can also go to ttb.org and you can download our Bible companion for Luke and you're going to love it. It's got a summary of Dr. McGee's teaching and you can read it with your Bible open and your heart ready to go deeper as the Lord leads you through his word. Download your copy today at ttb.org. Or you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find it. Now, as we go today, I'd ask you to keep this ministry sustained through your daily intercession before the Lord. It really is the most important way for you to support through the Bible. If you would, take some time today to partner in taking God's whole word to the whole world. 
See you next time when the Bible bus comes back by your way again, or hop aboard anytime, any day, through any of our digital outlets. We live in a great day to study God's Word. Jesus came home, to him I home. Sin had left a crimson Today's study is always available, free to stream or download, thanks to the generous and faithful investments from your fellow Bible bus travelers. Just go to ttb.org or download our app to listen again anytime. As always, we'd love to know what's God teaching you.